So hello everybody, thank you for attending today's webinar presented by Javier Campos on practical use cases of artificial intelligence in finance. Javier Campos, who re we remind you, works at Experian as head of data labs for the UK, Ireland and EMEA divisions. We would also like to thank him for his presence and for accepting to share his knowledge with as many people as possible. During this webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions either in writing in the chat room or by activating your microphone at the very end of the presentation when I will announce the Q&A time. This event is finally expected to last one hour. Throughout the presentation, please be careful to mute your microphones and not disturb the speaker. Behavior that interferes with the smooth running of the webinar will result in exclusion from the event. Now that everything has been said, I leave the floor to you, Javier, and good webinar to all. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> as, as the introduction, my name is Javier Campos. I'm the head of the Data Labs for uh, Experian uh, UK Anemia. I'll introduce uh, very briefly what Experian is, so, so you understand what we do and why we have these um, all this experience. Um, then I will uh, go into definition of uh, artificial intelligence, why it's actually uh, very important, and um, you will see uh, a couple of um, uh, very important points. Then I will continue to to just focus on a couple of uh, use cases we've been we've been working. So the data labs uh, in Experian they've been running for 11 years. They were launched back in 2010. So they they many many projects we we have done. But just gonna focus on two or three projects. And at the end I will try to leave uh, about 10 minutes or so for questions in case someone wants to to ask. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I also included a couple of uh, slides about going into a career in artificial intelligence for those that are might be interested. OK, so I'll start going very quickly. So Experian, as I said, some of you might or might not be familiar depending on the country where we are, but effectively we are a data company. So we help uh, both companies and consumers uh, to make financial decisions or well, a number of decisions by providing data. And as you can see, depending on the country that you live, uh, you will you will see us in all this space. So we we of the most countries we have uh, uh, we do lo what is called the Bureau of Credit, which is a register of every consumer in a given country. Uh, for example, the UK, Spain, um, yeah, the US. Uh, we actually hold a record of every consumer um, the credit score. So the, the way we do that is we receive information from all the banks in the country. Uh, quite regularly every month and uh, then we compile all the data and then we create a score which actually tells what is the probability you will pay back if you get a, a, a loan. Um, so that that the, the key information. But as you can see, we also have quite a lot of uh, provide, uh, data and software to, to companies to do insurance in online shopping. And we also have a lot of fraud, fraud and identity services. You will see some of the project we've done. Uh, in some countries as well, we have the uh, vehicle, so we can check that the, the if you're going to buy a car in the UK, we can tell you, you know, if that car has been in accidents, uh, whether it's genuine or not. So, um, finally, in countries like the US, we do have a division in health as well, which is quite quite interesting. Um, well, we are as 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 previously said in in about 45 countries, uh, nearly 18 uh, 18,000 employees and. Um, you can actually see some of the numbers there in terms of revenues, country, um, and so on. So going into the actual data labs, okay, that's Experian is a financial company, provides uh, financial data to, to do a number of services, but what is actually the data labs within the company? Well, we are a bit like the R&D part of Experian, and we have four hubs, uh, the one in London, which is the one I manage that we cover the UK and EMEA, but then we also have another one in San Diego to cover the US, in Sao Paulo for Latin America, um, in Singapore for, for APAC. And our job is really to create a new generation of um, 
of uh, product. So we do have a really highly skilled teams of R&D uh, data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, and, and product managers. And, and our job is constantly be scanning the market, scanning the technologies, and coming up with potential new products that uh, eventually all the company will use. That's why AI is uh, is actually on our on our case. Um, the one thing here to to emphasize is, of course, we, we do artificial intelligence, but we not just uh, AI. We pretty much look at every single new technology that come up. For example, um, and it's not in this presentation, we look in uh, emerging technology like quantum computing, um, which we think is actually going to uh, go into full production much sooner than we thought within the next couple of years. Uh, a few years ago, I would have not said this, uh, it's advanced quite a lot, um, very surprisingly. So quantum computing, uh, cryptography, um, for example, we're doing quite a lot of in Web3 web uh, in terms of the sort of crypto, the centralized finance. So, so our job is just to look at everything that is coming out from technology. We also look at the metaverse, for example, what could be the implications, see how we can see the new technology coming up to solve business problem and then apply it. That's why we, we do. And of course, AI is, is a big thing of what we do. Uh, the one thing to say is we do appear in uh, what we have the thought leadership. So if you look at the uh, in Harvard Business Review, we we publish quite regularly uh, sort of reports at what we take, you know, and uh, for example, what we do. We also appear on television and you probably see there my, my face. I, I did some interviews on ITV and BBC. Those are uh, British channels for, for those of you living um, outside what the BBC is, is quite famous everywhere, but um, we, we did a project which I'm going to talk a little bit about the, in here, uh, the COVID, and that's when we, we went onto the, onto the BBC in collaboration with the um, NHS, which is the, the health system, uh, service in, in the UK. And this is the head of the globally, uh, Eric, which appear on the CNN. So I think that you can see we do get a lot of coverage from the media because we do a lot of our projects get quite a lot of high impact. And this is, we've been in, uh, appearing in this book, um, which is being written by, by an expert, nothing to do with Experian and innovation. It talks about the usual suspect, you know, Google, um, we Experian have a chapter because of the, of the data labs. So going now into what we what we hear, uh, the first question is, um, um, some of you uh, might have a, a lot of this background. Um, so we'll go uh, fairly quickly, um, and then at the end I'll, I'll, I'll go into some of the uh, machine. But I think you know there is a lot of confusion about what is AI, what is ML. Is you know people say it's different. I think it's one of those things. It's quite difficult to define actually because uh, and it's not very clear. Um, people confuse, for example, when people talk about AI, sometimes they are talking about narrow AI, and sometimes they're talking about AGI, which is uh, artificial generic intelligence, which is a more more um, more generic one. But but basically, uh, you know, AI the definition, and if you look at the Oxford Dictionary is anything that can perform a task that require human level intelligence that system can be can be thought of uh, artificial intelligence as i said most of when people said about ai is mostly at the moment is narrow ai which they can do a task a very specific task they don't do a more you know at the moment we don't generalize very well and i can i'll talk a little bit about the at the end on, on the on the myths um, the important also, also the things to to understand is uh, how sort of ML is different from the traditional system. When you look at the, all of the system or the vast majority of software systems today in every industry, not just in finance, but pretty much everywhere, they all made in software and the software is being built, getting the requirements and those requirements are specific rules. You know, someone, a business analyst have gone, what the software uh, exactly performed. If this happened, then something has happened. So these rules have been coded by a human. So when you use machine learning, um, that that's actually, uh, you don't really tell the machine the rules. 
what you do is you you come up and you say this is your objective objective function something you have to optimize and then the machine gets the data and it takes decisions to to maximize or, or what, minimize maximize whatever depending but basically you you tell it uh, this is your objective function and then the machine change and makes the rules according to uh, comply with the, the objective function that you program. And that's a quite a subtle but very big difference, which means, uh, and that's what it called machine learning, because it can actually learn from the data. When it sees the data, it will uh, take it and, and learn depending on the algorithms. And again, we can talk a, a little bit about them later on. Um, but I think that the key message here is, you know, an easy way to explain what is a traditional software, mostly rule-based algorithm based on machine learning. The rules are made explicit by by a human on the on the software. Somebody has to do them. And and the other thing is when there is a new situation on the rules, the program fails because it hasn't seen it before. Versus machine learning, you don't program every single situation. You just program an objective function and the objective function is able to in new situations, make the right call because it's been uh, asked to, you know, depending on how well you do this, this objective function, then you can you can do much uh, better or worse. Um, so why 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 AI is important? And people saying is that you know another sort of technology uh, um, was the name hype. Uh, as you know, if you know in technology, every now and then there is a new a new wave of new uh, developments. It was the internet, there was the mobile, you know, the, there is a lot of these technologies, wave of technologies and Garner and the analysts talk about and they have this sort of a uh, curve of the technologies coming in and out. Uh, is AI another one like that or is something quite different? Well, I think the AI and, and this is why it's very, very different from just an another technology because it's what we call a foundational technology. Why? Well, similar to electricity, and electricity people don't think about it, but it really changed society at the beginning of the century. Why? Because elect before electricity, if you want the power, you have to go to where the power was done, which was in a large in a large factory. And those factories, by the way, they were also close to where the raw material is, the mines. So if you look at even in the um, in the UK, in Britain, where the Industrial Revolution was born, most of the factories were really, really close to where the carbon was, the coal was. Um, that's why, and then society sort of uh, organized around that. What happened is once society, uh, sorry, electricity appears, that changed because all of a sudden you can decentralize the power. You can send power away. And that completely changed the makeup of the towns. And all of a sudden you could actually have towns that they were separated from the mines. They were, you could then send and, and that, you know, this sort of subtlety becomes to a completely chain of society, how the, the people were arranged, new cities, towns and, and villages. So similarly, AI uh, is going gonna, is gonna to have a massive chain in society as well. Why? Because with AI, what you're doing is you are, again, decentralizing. But now what you're decentralizing is the human level decisions. You know, at the moment today in our society, a lot of processes are around uh, at some point a human have to make a decision. So the, the sort of the software, the companies, uh, the processes, they all run there. Once you, that decision, human decision, you can actually decentralize to the edge, then that's going to change a lot. It's going to change uh, a lot of our society, how we organize jobs, you know, some of the jobs Today, that some of the jobs we know today, they, they might not be tomorrow. The ones we know today, they will be changed. Uh, that's why, um, so the key message in this slide is AI will change the way we, we work because it will, is able to, to distribute that uh, 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 human level uh, decision uh, to, the, to the edge where the consumer is. So, you know, if you are on a phone, on a website, Today, you don't really, you get just a, a, the same. Everybody's treated the same with some rules that someone has done in the in the future. It will feel like you are actually with your own personal assistant or if you are doing banking, your own personal banker because it will just look into what you have and it will make a, a decision. So that's that's why the AI is a, is a big deal. And um, the other thing is, well, AI is, 
you know, it's magic. Why, why does it work? Well, the, the way it works, and, and this is we're still investigating, by the way, because it's, um, it's not <clears throat> fully, fully known. But I think that the main, the main thing is what AI does is exploits the symmetries uh, that are on the data sets. So if, if you, which is, there is a really nice analogy with physics for those of you that, that actually study. If you think about physics, is it's actually quite interesting. Uh, it's, it's amazing, to be honest, that a very few formulas in, in physics can explain pretty much all uh, physical processes. And the reason why that happened is because nature has a lot of symmetry. You know, the reason why the electromagnetic rules were that way, there is a lot of symmetry. So actually, when you and there is a very nice paper which does this comparison. When you look about machine learning, it's the same thing. Machine learning is able to exploit those symmetries uh, there. So if you look at, for example, a deep a deep learning um, system that is classifying, you know, is doing the different images, classifying images between car and dog. Where actually, when you look at what the system is doing, the, the neural network is actually uh, separating the um, doing the um, looking at the symmetries that are and um, exploiting those symmetries to make able to, to to be able to make a decision um so so yeah so i think again uh, the key message here is ai works because of the symmetries on the data is no magic and it works very well and it works better than the the rule base because it can when you have as i said the objective function it can uh, make good decisions when it is unseen unseen data so now going now into finance and some of the project we're doing. So in finance, uh, when you look at what I said, you know, AI can, um, well, the first thing I will say is AI can actually change pretty much most industries. Uh, the more you probably see AI needs data. So you need to have data. And the other thing is, is sort of exploit the symmetries in the data when they are especially, so so whenever we, we, we have uh, data from, from humans, humans, we actually, um, um, believe it or not, we are uh, quite behavioral, meaning we tend to to uh, to behave the same way uh, all over and over. Um, so that's why uh, the um, you know any any data that is captured in this behavior, there will be a symmetry, and the symmetry means that I I you know things humans do things, uh, you know we all do things in a similar way we all have of course everyone has their own personality just to this is the sort of behavioral science of course everyone has their own personality but actually when you look at within your own personality you behave certain ways you know you wake up you do things and and that's the signal that the ai pick to really be able to predict how human each human will do different but you know they can be predicted because on that sort of behavioral uh, repetition that humans we we do so any so basically anything that has data that is uh, coming from from humans you could you know ai can can apply so some of the the key use cases for finance any process automation so for example if you have a bank uh, the, the the process at the moment to when you have to underwrite a mortgage at the moment is a process which is lengthy because you have to got a lot of uh, paperwork documentation that has to be sent to a bank in a bank which there is a massive queue um, an underwriter have to uh, review all the applications, look at all the documents, make a decision. This could take weeks and weeks. It's very stressful for the consumer. That can all be automated to a, a, a lot of degree. So AI could do that. The other one, of course, is security. You know, at the moment, the detecting when there are, uh, for example, you know, if, if you look at the, the banks, um, and this is why people are a scam, especially vulnerable people. So for example, some elderly people are very vulnerable to being uh, scammed by people calling them, pretending to be from the tax or the police or, you know, and the police, please send me that money or whatever. Um, if you think about it, you, you could actually, and there are already some, some tests, you can have a system monitoring the accounts. And if there is a unusual behavior, you can actually contact there. Like, for example, if I see you try to, to send money to the police, I said, well, whatever is at the police or you put something there, you could say, look, this is a bit unusual. Let's call one of our people because I don't think 
that's actually the real police. The real police would not never able to tell you that. So the security aspect is also very important. That's well, the process automation is underwriting and credit scoring. Again, at the moment, sometimes these things have to be manually. You could automate all of these. The other area, which uh, um, the algorithmic trading, you know, uh, today in the stock market, there is there is quite a lot of AI, and you probably heard something called a market flash car flash uh, crash, which is when all of a sudden the market sort of go down very quickly. That happened a few times in the early 2000. People didn't know until when the FC, the uh, the FCA, but well, the FCA, the FT, what's the name of the, but well, the organization, the SEC, the organization that sort of check, you know, is in charge of of overseeing the the, the markets in the US. They they actually find out that the, the you know the whole crash and that happened. I think the first one happened in the 90s. So the first you know went down without any anyone knowing what's going on whatsoever. I think it went down like probably like 15 percent within seconds. And what happened is they have all these high trading algorithms, which these algorithms were using AI and they were well, the, the way they were making money, they were predicting doing macro uh, micro uh, buys very quickly. So buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. And um, if you think about it mathematically, they were predicting where uh, the, the, the share price was going to go up or down. And if they could predict it more than 50 percent, which actually is that's random, you could make a lot of money because you're doing a lot of this. That's what is called high frequency trading. Uh, the problem with that is when if only there is only one of those in the market, they will make a lot of money. No, in doesn't nothing happen. But when you have all the systems that are trading shares are doing this, what happens is if for whatever reason, which is what happened in a in a flash in a flash crash, if one starts selling, they all start selling, 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 and before you know, you just drop like ten or I think the first one it was quite famous. It's like 10, 15 percent. So. Algorithmic trading, there's already a lot of going on, a lot more coming there, a lot of future. And then, of course, the robot advisory. So again, if you go to a bank, imagine having a personal advisor looking at you. You know, you go to a bank and they give you generic advice. So in the website here, they will tell you exactly, uh, you know, what you want for, for them. So these are the, the typical use cases, many, um, you know, the many ones. Uh, these are some of the ideas we're doing in, in our lab. So we have categorization engines. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about that. We have uh, fraud modules. We have uh, credit scores. And, and this is the ideation. This is the things we're looking. We're looking at synthetic data, climate change. This is how to calculate the carbon footprint, just looking at, at your data. Uh, things to do anti money laundering as well. You can calculate, you know, you can, is that person, is that person that is trying to open a bank account? Is that going to do money laundering or not? You can, you can do that. So you will see there quite a lot of uh, different projects. Uh, they all um, in the same use cases. So a couple of things there to see because AI, um, you know, it, you probably see there is a lot of potential and you will say, oh, hold on, this is so amazing. Why? Why we don't have AI everywhere, and the the reality is, and this this slide is even when is from 2017 is actually the same. The same the situation hasn't changed much, and the only very few models made it all the way to production. Uh, so AI is quite hard to do. It's very powerful but hard to do. Why, why is that? Well, um, you know when you look at there and the first top of the slide, this actually come from a McKinsey report. To do uh, AI well, you have to really understand uh, these five things. And when these things are not understood, then you, you know, the, the project will not work. It might work on the lab when you have a model which in perfect conditions work, but when you put it in the real world with real data, it just doesn't, doesn't fly. So, you know, these five points, which are having the right use case, and you will hear me a lot how to do properly. And these, believe it or not, many people still get it wrong. You know, I've seen people starting this the other way around. They say, oh, well, I have what data, you know, first to start AI, I'm going to clean, I'm going to turn on my data systems and clean all the data. That, for example, doesn't make any sense. You know, you can't just data on its own is not really nothing. You have to really understand what the use case is and then once you really understand what's the problem what data do you need which in some cases you might need another data that you don't have and in some cases you might need okay now i need that data and i need to clean it in this way 
what it doesn't make sense is to have data on its own, just uh, generic, and you still see big companies doing things the other way around, and they all making large, uh, massive programs when they spend a lot of money and a lot of time on doing, you know, like uh, lake systems and things like that. Uh, that's not the best way to, to do AI. Then the, use the right techniques and tool again. Um, here, the, the, the one mistake I, I see doing many organizations is to, to try uh, AI, treat AI as if it was a software pro program. So you have the model, you put it, you deploy it to production and you forget about it. You know, you leave it there or as an API. That is a big mistake. It's not quite the same. You, you need, but we, we can, I can talk about it later on and you need to do it. And the other one is the organization and culture. So many companies, people are not familiar with AI, so they're very afraid of, of trying it and they don't do it. And then, and then the the other thing is to have the right teams. You know, do we do we have the right uh, data science teams and and so on? So I think these things are important. Um, you know, it can be done, and when it's done, is bring you a lot of value. And if you look at the big technology companies, the Amazon, the the Google, all these guys, we in Experian, we also have quite a few products there in in, in AI in production and getting a lot of value, but many organizations even today they hardly use ai the other thing for example which is another uh, this is true with the current generation of ai uh, which is a little uh, well, dirty secret of ai which it needs a lot of humans on the back you know if you look at this alexa for example i don't know if you realize but alexa the, the reason why it's so good because when it's talking to you uh, if it doesn't when it doesn't really understand uh, alexa communicate to the to the Amazon uh, uh, servers and eventually some of your conversation might go to a human so the human can label and labeling meaning and, and this is the reason why one of the techniques in AI is NLP uh, and on NLP uh, you have to um, label for example a sentence what is an intent and a, an intent is what what is that sentence mean so when you do it in NLP or in this case voice recognitions, the first one is a speech to text, which is how do I recognize what the person said into text that actually for a single person in English is okay. There are libraries that they work quite well, but you know, if you look other languages or when you have a lot of noise or conversations or it can become quite difficult for a machine to understand which who said what and, and where, um, uh, but still it works relatively well. So effectively, if I say uh, I want to go to Paris, so an speech to text will generate a file with that sentence, I want to go to Paris. Then you need to pass it to another uh, part of the system, which is to what is the intent of that? And that the, that's the one it translates the meaning of that sentence. In this case, this person wants to book a uh, uh, a flight to Paris. So if you are in a website for, you know, Expedia or whatever for, for flights, then that's fine. So this, when you train the system, a human has to train it. And then when you have, you end up with a lot of these sentences, what they call utterances and the intents, which has been the labels, and then that's how you can train. So Alexa, that's the way it works. So effectively, Alexa gets so efficient because you have these call centers, which are, um, well, not call centers, they are these these places in, in countries of low cost, like Philippines, India, um, and so on. And you have hundreds of people uh, listening to the messages, transcribing and, and putting what do they mean. And then that is fed into the machine and then the machine gets better and better and better. You only send there the interesting one, but this is something to, um, to bear in mind. So the other thing in the future of AI, and, and I'm gonna touch briefly, one of the things also about AI, which you know, we, we, it's not a black box, but we need to start talking about the uh, how this AI was produced. So one of the things we've been talking for some time, you know, they're saying that food have a label. You know, if you go to a supermarket, you know exactly what is in a can. We should be able to do at some point uh, for every algorithm, you should have like some sort of like a label telling you, okay, this data set is that, have you checked that the data set doesn't discriminate? Uh, do you know who the accountability, who actually, if something goes wrong with the algorithms, who is accountable for there? Uh, you know, have you tried the transparency, what data is used, the, the customer and so on. So 
this will come uh, and at the moment AI is quite uh, starting, but eventually in the future it will it will come there. So now going deep into a few examples, and this is now uh, part of you know the output of my, my my lab over the last year or so. So this project is it was quite actually interesting. Uh, we did it with when COVID with COVID happened. We partnered with one of the NHS trusts in uh, Nottingham one in particular. And basically, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, and it still it still is happening by the way, uh, there was a lot of uh, well, uh, mess with what data, what isn't, the model, what is predicting. Um, the models are still, uh, they are not very good predicting. Um, and in the in the UK, the first models were based on infections and they were giving really weird scenarios, which they weren't really sure whether they were true or not. So we actually work with the NHS and we develop uh, at the uh, level. So rather than having a national level chain, you know, nationally the R is one, and and we work with a hospital. Why hospitals need to know that in advance? Because they need to know. So, for example, if the R, you probably are familiar now with these numbers because of the news, but the R not or R zero call is the ratio of where the disease is spread, and it's basically if one person have the in this case COVID, or this applies to all infectious diseases. So, if I have COVID, how many people do I pass it? So if that number is bigger than one, it means the uh, the the um, the disease is spreading and technically even exponentially. Because if I pass it to two people, then those two people pass it to then four, those four to eight, and that number very quickly. And this is why humans we don't understand very well exponentially. That's why uh, you know a few in an exponential um, model, a few days or weeks can make a massive difference. So these models were not very good. So we, bottom line, we work with them three months and we manage, and, and sorry, the hospital need to know about the R because they need to calculate what's going to be the demand in two or three weeks ahead. Why? Because they need to understand how many nurses I have to put in reception, how many doctors I need to be in rota, how many ventilators I need, how many uh, oxygen, which was also actually a big problem in the UK, it wasn't on the news, but it was a big problem. So all these things you need to know. So you need a model that advance. So eventually we work with the with the NHS trust and we develop this using a uh, Bayesian hierarchical model, which is quite a, an advanced algorithm, which will allow us. And I think here the the main um, the main innovation was to use that is the artificial intelligence using. Uh, you will see a lot of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms using Bayesian type uh, approaches, which uh, a Bayesian type you always use priors to sort of to uh, understand what is the the probability. You know, in a, in a normal frequencies sort of algorithms, you always calculate the probability of an event without taking into account what has happened before. Versus in a Bayesian model, you always look at what are the prior, what are the prior, and then taking into account the prior, what I can do. So they're very powerful uh, method and they use in some of the, the most advanced AI models. Um, <clears throat> so here the, the important thing is, as well as the method, which was quite more advanced than the traditional, uh, you know, the, if you look at the um, the classical infection models, they're, they're quite, they're a second order equation, they're exponential, but they're very, very uh, simplistic. That was quite a more complex, taking ages into account. And I think the other big uh, innovation here is the data sets. Rather than we know, we find out very quickly that the infections, the reported infections, were close to useless. Why? Because the reported infections depend on how much texting you're doing, and you keep changing that all the time. So because you change it, and if you don't test, you don't see. If you might be testing a lot, so it is actually useless. What we found, better proxies for how the disease was impacting, and we did done a lot of modeling with historical data, uh, is the numbers, the calls to a number in the UK, 111, which is like the, um, there, like, and also the mobility. The data Google and Apple, they released during COVID, they're still doing it, by the way, um, the mobility, the average mobility. So we know there is a massive, there is a massive correlation of how the disease is spreading versus how much people is moving. I mean, it makes sense. But by doing the mobility and the 111 calls, we could predict fairly accurate 
was the R was going to be much better than the government looking at infections, which uh, not surprisingly, they made it quite a few mistakes. And then the other thing we did is the hotspot risk map. So that was, you know, during the whole pandemic, uh, Nottingham was one of the, I think they never experienced any any problems with the planning in during COVID, which a lot of hospitals in the UK, they did because they didn't have a good planning and they either run out of doctors or oxygen, Nottingham, thanks to our model, could do a pretty good job. So that's one thing. Going into now finance, uh, then here we just launched a product in the UK. So in the UK, if you if you live there, you can uh, increase your credit score and you have to go with an app. You share your, uh, there is something called open banking in, in Europe. In France, it's called PSD2, which is the same concept. You can share your bank account with apps and do certain things. But the concept here is we can categorize the, um, sorry, you, you expose your data, then we categorize automatically. Uh, and this uses machine learning, NLP. So you you can see here how, how this works. You do cut the, trans, the full transaction of your open banking. You cut it in, in, in tokens, engrams, technically. Uh, and then you do a bit of supervise and unsupervise. And then eventually you find out, okay, that in this, in this case, this transaction is betting. Why is it important to categorize this? Because then when you categorize, so the first thing is uh, uh, automatically and real time, you categorize all your transactions and two years is about 2000 transactions. And then on top of that, you create a model to then calculate the credit score with this information, which you don't have on the normal credit score. And then you see how the, 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 the system, the way it works. I see if I can boost your score or not. If I cannot boost, uh, I don't do it, but if I can, I will boost uh, a few points. So this, we launched this in the UK and also in the US, very, very successful. Uh, it has, uh, and, and actually it's a big thing because if you increase your credit score, means A, you can get more loans or credit cards than before you couldn't, and B, even the ones you can, you get them with a cheaper interest rate. So it's, it's good for the consumer. It's also good for the bank because it's less risk, so they can afford to do it. And the way to, you know, here the trick is you're using AI and the data. So in terms of now looking at the sum of the data, and, and again, gaining a bit uh, now technical for those of you that are more interested in uh, sum of the genius. So if you look at a traditional, uh, this is a model to calculate the probability of default, you know, uh, in one year. It's called, that's, that's what a credit score or a scorecard is. Um, then you have a single bureau and dual bureau. In the UK, there are a few bureaus. Um, the more data you use, you get the more the more benefit. Although it's expensive, so you need to do the business case. But anyway, let's you know if you do uh, the traditional logistical regression with a single bureau, you have this sort of Gini. Uh, compare using machine learning, you you that you you do get a much more uh, increase. And I will explain how this this uh, come. So you actually get the Gini uplift of eight Gini point uplift, and more importantly, thirty. Well, it's also linked. You get also a bad rate reduction compared to traditional models. And this is how well, part of the the way we did the project. So we we take some of the ban applications. We use the dual bureau, which is all our credit score data, and then we'll but, do the preprocessing pass it to the to the machine learning the calibration and then we created these models that they in this case this bank put it into production there the one thing we we do is every time you do a new scorecard you have to do what is called swap set which the concept is okay if my old model have and, and you do the swap set across the um, sort of uh, close to the cutoff point you say okay what percentage of good and bad this uh, when you when you create a new model, how will then impact these things with the old model behave like that? You know, the old, the old model have this accuracy, have these mistakes, the new one with us. So effectively, what you found is you can, uh, you know, the, you can massively re reduce the the bad rate from the original model to the new one, and that's by nearly 36 percent, which is a lot, by the way. When you think about a bank, uh, some of the, you know, if this is a credit risk for a loan. And there's a big ban, and the portfolio, you know, it's called the book, is 50 million. You know, uh, reducing the bar rate by 36 percent—that's a lot of money. That's a, and it's the same data. It's just a good, a better technique. 
The other thing which we actually did, we as well as, okay, if we now have a machine learning model compared to the traditional one, but it's actually, is the new model uh, discriminating more than, and when we did the, uh, you know, when you check in for fairness, you have to check first the metrics and we'll go, we don't have time to go into the details. I mean, the fairness on AI is a fascinating topic really you know it could be another two hours talking about that and we, we actually developed my lab a product and this is why we did it so then you have to get a attribute uh, which this is the protected attribute what you want to make sure you know you don't discriminate and here we put gender age sex nationality uh, sexual orientation blah blah you can put whatever um, uh, sensitive attribute and then what you do is okay if i have and this is how the fairness text work so imagine you, you're you going to check for nationality. So what you say is, look, if in the wider population you have all these people with these nationalities, my model should have similar um, similar rate ratios. So if there are, I don't know, one, I'm going to make that up, 5% uh, from foreign, foreign origin versus 10% uh, well, or whatever it is these days in every country, the model should do the same. If you, if the uh, overall population have certain distribution but your credit score let's say doesn't give any credit to the you know foreign people say well there is a problem there you know your model somehow is discriminating you need that doesn't mean by the way there is a problem you need to understand why the model is doing that if the model is doing that based on income and on um then that's something you can justify to the regulator but if he's doing that using things like for example postcode or or using data that is not really relevant to do, to your finance, then you can be in trouble. That's why you need to check uh, each of the attributes and each of the metrics. Uh, as I said, the metrics, this is for for, for hours. Uh, there are many different types um, there. So the other thing, and this is the, you know, why machine learning, well, la heuristica regression is literally, a, um, I mean, this is a simplified two, two variables, but as you know, a normal credit score have hundreds of these. So to visualize that, you have to have a multi-dimension with hundred dimensions. We're not going to do that because humans, we have trouble to see more than three dimensions, but in two, you can get the idea. So basically, a logistical regression is a is a line. In two dimensions, will be a plane. In you know three, four, five, it's a multi, but it's just one line versus the machine learning model allows to be much more uh, precise. That's why uh, you can actually get the um, that and the machine learning model actually does better to the the other thing that, that that's very good is for the new customers. So this is how the machine learning work works by you know not being it's, it's not linear, so it allows to to match better the the data set. And the other thing is for new customers, it works better. So that's the first, you know, we talk about the use cases. So we talk about that credit risk using machine learning model, how much better from the logistical regression. Another use case in this case is for financial, uh, uh, for fraud, anomaly detection. So this is, and probably you have experienced this at some point, you go, you have a credit card, you travel, and in some cases, if you go, you know, you just land, the, let's say you're based in France, you go for holiday in Spain, you just land in Spain, you want to go to a shop, you try to use your credit card and you, de you deny it. Uh, sometimes happens, sometimes not, and say, well, what, what's going on? Well, the problem is the, uh, um, okay, the traditional systems in fraud, uh, they basically call rule-based systems. You know what I said before? So in fraud, in this case, Traditionally, it's a combination of uh, one of the major um, rules for, for fraud is proximity. So effectively, if your credit card is registered in France in an address, the closer you are to that address in Nice, the less probability of fraud. There are more rules, but that's the first one. So when, uh, so what happens is if, and this is why it's a suggestion, if you travel to another country and you don't use the credit card in the airport or when you go there, if the system goes from seeing the car in Nice, all of a sudden it sees it in Malaga, depending on what it is, it might actually reject it. And there are some rules. And if it's, if actually I can tell you, if it's a big amount, probably there. So what we use, what we did is this is not right. Uh, we can do it better using AI. And in AI, we use uh, embedding, neural embeddings. And I think the neural embeddings, and I'm going to, uh, well, I think these slides can be distributed, but uh, of the time so the way it works you 
convert your input space, which in this case is the transaction, you know, if, if you think about it, you're getting a credit card of is that fraud or not? So you need to see, okay, what is the amount? What is the location? Or, you know, what is you, what is the merchant as well? You, you check um, oh, in the next one. So you, you check these things, you know, when uh, the time, uh, the online, uh, how much, and the merchants, yeah. So normal rules, as, as I said, and th sometimes they fail. Uh, what we did is don't forget about the rules. Let's use uh, all a combination of that. And then what we did is we created these embeddings so we can do a electronic signature of what you want to, what you like to buy. So we do the combination of all those. So effectively, if you like to buy a coffee every morning in Nice, when you go on holidays, if you do the same, this system will not reject your car because it knows, look, that's consistent with your behavior. You like to buy, you know, the frequency, you every morning you get three euros on a Starbucks or whatever, that's fine, whether it's three euros, but in, or even if you go to the US and you spend four dollars, it's the same sort of thing, it's okay. Um, and using this thing, which I, you know, I, unfortunately I don't have time to go through through all the details of the model, but you can actually see with just 20% of uh, fraud, so that's, does that system have a, a lot of advantages reducing the, the false uh, negative? False negative is exactly what I said. If you are genuine, your credit card go on holidays and you decline, but it's your credit card, you are very annoyed because you cannot use it. That's a false positive. With the rules, it's quite high. Using machine learning, and in this case, neural network and embeddings, you can really reduce that quite a lot. So uh, the last few, I uh, just want to spend five minutes, uh, you know, if you, what are the different ways to get a AI? I had a, a slide about the general uh, trends on AI, some of the myths, and we can talk a little bit, and then I'll, I'll leave uh, about 10 minutes for, for questions. So, you know, actually, um, well, probably you're already uh, working on a on a postdoc or you, you're working on a BEA, so you've already done your, um, your degree, but actually the, the one thing, and I put this slide because people get sometimes very, uh, they think, oh, I have to, you know, I, unless I've done computer science, I cannot do. Actually, that's not the case. And a lot of people I hire have a lot of these different backgrounds. The other interesting thing is there are two things here new, which you might or might not surprise you. Law and philosophy, we want to see people coming into the field because ethics is going to be a big area and the same with biomedics, uh, bioinformatics. Um, then you know, if you want to get into the, uh, as a practitioner into AI, so you can actually do to an apply AI. So for example, my job, so my job is to take AI and apply it in financial services, but you can go to any company. You could also look at the research uh, path, but that might, you know, for that you might have to get a PhD and get into a university. And that's, that's fundamental research on AI. Or another way to really get very involved is to get a, a startup, either you own one or, or get into one. Uh, you will see <coughs> what I said at the beginning. This is some of the AI jobs. Some of those are already today. Some of them are going to be in the future. So they're going to be, for example, AI forensics will become quite big, by the way, as more and more AI start doing it. Machines behave different than, than us. You're going to need as experts doing that. A chief ethics officer as well, chief ethics officer. You know, the more and more AI you have, you're going to have to start thinking about what are the implications from the ethical point of view, what I want to do, what I don't. Uh, so you will see some of these, uh, you know, some of these jobs are uh, today, uh, researcher, uh, sort of data scientist, DevOps, AI, and so on. Some others might come new, cybersecurity as well, very big. But the point is that there's quite a few jobs coming. So in terms of the long terms versus myth fast, and, and I will uh, yeah, consider of them very, very quickly. So you will see here, for example, the myth, and here there are two myths about what is the potential of AI. Some people are panicking, saying tomorrow is going to happen. Uh, some people are saying it's impossible. So those are the two myths. The reality is we don't know. Um, you know, the experts, if, if you ask me, I don't think, uh, I think it should be possible, but I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but as I said, the experts, and you, sh you should know that the experts disagree. The other myth is, oh, well, only the really people that they don't like technology worry about AI. The fact is, and I'm me including, actually that's not the case. You know, AI, and I talk a little bit about if, and this is a strong AI, which as I say, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but when it happens, we really need to worry. This is a technology that has the potential to destroy humanity. I'm being a bit alarmistic, but the point is, 
you know, not every technology we do can, can you know, uh, any technology, and there are some, a lot of books about the risk to humanity, at, including an asterisk, and you probably see that the Netflix move, but also any technology that can replicate itself is a danger for, for us. And AI could, at some point, you know, uh, think think about that and, and replicate and be a problem. I mean, AI on its own is not a problem, but accessing resources in the real world, it is a problem. Now, the the the, the other myth, which is the Terminator and the Hollywood movies, uh, you know, the problem is AI, like the metrics, all of a sudden the machines are going to say, no, I will want to kill the human and that. Actually, that's not the risk, but the, the actual worry is misalignment. Remember that AI, you have to do objective function. You have to tell that objective function is really, really hard. And, you know, anyone that has put objective to a team, you will know how difficult it is to put objective to humans because they can be counterdictors. The same will be with the machine. If we're not careful and we give the machine the wrong objective, it might be detrimental. So, for example, imagine you create an artificial intelligence system and say, look, I want you to make sure uh, just fix climate change. You know, if you say just like that, the machine might analyze all the data and say, you know what, the problem is humans. I kill all the humans. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll solve your problem. I fix climate change. Unfortunately, nobody told the machine. Well, actually, you, you know that and oversimplifying, but this is a, the, the risk is misalignment. It's not the machine because the problem is that's when we humanize. The machine will not hate us. To do that, you have to to get emotions there, but emotions is not the same as intelligence. Then the other fact, myth, you know, the robots uh, are the concern, the Terminator, actually, no. The fact is you don't need a, a body. You just need a, a program that escaped to the internet. Another myth that, you know, AI can control uh, humans. Uh, the fact is, well, we need to be um, careful. We might be able to do it. Uh, the myth is machines can have goals. Uh, the fact is, actually, they do. And by the way, they are already AI using in words, which is very concerning, and we should do something about this. Um, and this is the final one. The super intelligence is years ago. Well, no, it might take decades, but we should plan ahead. This is coming back to, you know, if, if you think an unconstrained super intelligence, you need to worry and do something about it. But anyway, so very quick three takeaways and we go to the to the questions in the last few minutes uh, the first one where are we in the ai journey the good news is we are at the beginning you know those of you are you might not remember here but this is what i put the the music it says a tape from the 80s uh, we, ai is like that you know even when you think in the news this is amazing or no there are so much to do we haven't fixed uh, you know there is so much to do we have what we call narrow AI. So for some things we do very, very well, you know, in deep learning, image recognition, we do very, very well, you know, playing chess or go fine, but there are, you know, our AI doesn't generalize at all. So we let alone the, the self-awareness of our. So we still very early days, which is good news if you want to come into the field. The point two is AI will change all our jobs. So either whether you go into the field or not, you really need to know about it. And the final one, and this, as I said, the, the presentation is that if you really want to start into that, you can, you know, I recommend a few books. This is amazing book. Uh, actually, the diagram with the myth is taken from here. You will see. Uh, if you are more technical, this is the best book, but you need some some high degree mathematics to to get there. And the best thing, like everything, is you learn by doing it. So just go into Kaggle. They have amazing data set and really, really nice things to that. The first one to which I recommend is the Titanic tutorial. So in Titanic, you, you, you might know, but there is a list of all the passengers of the, the, the Titanic, including who survived and who didn't. You can actually have fun trying to use AI to predict who was going to survive or not. Uh, quite interesting, by the way. Uh, I won't, I won't, uh, I'll let you to do it if you want to do that. Okay, so I think there's about uh, seven minutes or so. So I'll, I'll, we'll open for questions comments uh, sorry i know it's, it's probably a lot of content yeah okay uh, first of all uh, thank you very much uh, javier for the presentation it was a uh, fascinating listening to you so i'm serge miranda in charge of the master degree here and um, definitely uh, that was a uh, fascinating a lot of questions a um, couple of the one just because you talk about finance it's not in the order but um, you just quote crypto money, metaverse somewhere. 
but this huge financial dimension built by crypto money and Bitcoin. Uh, do you have any concrete use case uh, in this area of crypto money or this kind of uh, crypto finance? And um, okay, so and your comments about that, about about this, your vision of AI and Bitcoin. For instance, talking about frauds, it could be interesting tomorrow to have kind of fraud detection by people using crypto money, if there are, et cetera, et cetera. You could imagine. So yes. what is your vision? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but it's, it's very, very big and complex. Uh, absolutely. The, um, you know, the, the way, and, and again, I think this is, the whole field is called Web3, which if you think about the reason it's called Web3 is Web1, 2, and 3, different generations in Web1 web was at the beginning of the web, everything was centralized in one place. Uh, so the content, and you could you could only consume content. The web two, you have two ways and you have the apps. And in web three, the ownership goes from the center to the, that's what is the, the centralized web. That's what they call it, the web three. Um, so massive potential. AI can do a lot of stuff and it's already doing. So there's a lot of fintech. So for example, the uh, you can, you know, you can use AI on the on the market to calculate whether, you know, at, at the moment I will say, and I think that crypto, I will separate the technology, which uses really good, like distributed layer, sort of some sort of symmetry and so on, versus the actual crypto as an asset, which is an investment asset. And if you look at BTC, you know, Bitcoin or Ether, it's got a value that goes up and down. Um, you know, that's another debate whether that make that. But in terms of the use cases for AI, many. So, for example, you have fraud. Uh, like you can actually, um, one of the things about Bitcoin is you, you you have to have a wallet ID to be able to transact. That wallet ID is anonymous, which is a problem for the identity, by the way. Uh, but eventually, if you can see, um, you, you can actually create uh, models that generate uh, what is the probability of this to be fraudulent or not? Um, this is actually quite important. And another area, for example, which I don't know if you have probably have heard about N NFTs, non-fungible tokens, yep. there is a lot of fraud. Um, effectively, the fraud is, and you can do it with the technology. You can create, you know, if you do it well, you, well, again, without going into the debate whether it makes sense or not to have a digital something for yourself and pay a lot of money for something that you can get a perfect copy. But anyway, I, know I won't go into that. Let's assume for a minute there. What happened is using protocols, uh, in some cases you come, um, and there are people already scamming a lot of people, uh, but using AI, you could actually reduce a lot of that. Uh, so you can, anything, so for example, to the optimizing the sort of the, um, the different transactions and the quite uh, in fraud reductions, which is, is going to be quite quite a lot uh, to the market as well to high trading there. So qu quite a few use use cases there in the in the technology. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just another question, also a couple of questions from a technical point of view. You emphasize uh, the fact of explicability uh, for AI. And I think that's a major issue even for researchers today, um, which is uh, we, which are plan who are planning today to um, solutions where you have hybrid AI using machine learning tools with rule-based rule system and deep learning tools where explicability is missing. And what is your experience concerning this kind of hybrid solutions? Uh, between deep learning and other machine learning methods? Yeah, explainability is an issue. It's also a complex one because, by the way, and if you think about this, and some people, you know, they always say, oh, it's a black box. Well, it, it depends on what it is and, and, and it isn't. So the first thing I will say, uh, which is a good point, every algorithm have different ways to be explained. And some of the algorithms are relatively easy to explain especially if you put some of the variables. So um, the one that is, uh, and that's what in the news, uh, the way, you know, a deep learning system, the way the way it sort of learns, it can be quite, quite obscure. And that can be quite difficult. So th there are a few things is it will be, it will be quite, uh, 
difficult to explain to a human in well, or or to or to say in a in a different in a way that um, a human would understand and, and the and the reason is because the machine is using other logic that we don't we don't use. Um, so for the right algorithm, you can explain it. Even using deep learnings, there actually can be technique that you can use it. And for example, the the the, the example on very quickly on explainability. Um, they there was they they program this uh, software to detect uh, a wolf from from a dog, and they train it with millions of pictures. It was absolutely 99.9 .9 perfect, you know, perfect. Then someone went to a zoo, took a picture of a wolf, passes to the system, and it failed completely. And then the the expert saying, "What's going on? That cannot happen. You know, that wolf is a very really clear wolf with the the big." The big there was going on. So what happened is uh, when when they look at the how they train the machine, they actually realize that all the pictures of the wolves were in nature, and because wolves tend to live in sort of high high level in mountains, pretty much everyone have snow. So effectively, what the machine has done, and this is what I said about the opaque opaque. I mean, this took months to to figure out what what the machine was doing. Well, the machine the machine is very good to get shortcuts and to really understand what it is. You know, you, you just put in the label. So th the way it works, you say, OK, this is wolf and you put the wolf. This is a picture of the wolf. This is a picture of dog, wolf, dog, dog. You fit off these million pictures and the machine then does the there. So what the machine was doing is it actually then is much more efficient. As soon as I see a snow, call it wolf and I make I make a, you know, I make the I, I make the prediction right. So effectively, if you think about it, the machine wasn't, you can argue, understanding because they, you know, humans, we all have a model of the world and that's how we explain things. Uh, the machines don't work like that. I mean, this generation of algorithms. So the point about explainability is absolutely, some algorithms are, and this is again, is, is a myth, you know, some algorithms is zero problem with explainability. They call, you know, an SG boost, like the ones I show, you can do the same explainability for the, well, it's a bit more difficult than the because the logistical regression is linear. So you can say for this income, I accept or not, which I might make a mistake, by the way, that's the other thing, but it's relatively easy to explain why you are rejecting. On the machine learning, because it's non-linear, sometimes the income is true, but sometimes it's not. So there's a bit more complicated explanation, but you can argue that it works better. And I think that's the the there. So, my 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 whole take is uh, this is an area that we are advancing. Uh, the other thing which also need to be, and and this is an area of research, we need we also need to be careful because a lot of the algorithms, but not just AI, even the current statistical algorithms are correlation based algorithms, which means they're not causal inference algorithms, which means they don't really explain. So. The point is, even the current algorithm is not really explaining, and you can see that in entry level college for for education, but um, but uh, not for others. So, big topic, uh, you know, even if you use deep learning, it can actually make. And for example, what happened on the deep learning, rather than teaching, let's say uh, the whole, the last problem, like for example, in a credit risk, you will say give all this data and predict if default or not, rather than doing this, what you would do is you start predicting individual features, you know, predict the income, predict the expense, and then all these things can be explained. And then you can use uh, deep learning, but use especially deep learning because uh, and the reason is the way, I uh, don't have time to explain, but it uses a lot of hidden layers. So it's not obvious to see what is what is doing. And, you know, even the snow example I mentioned, it took months to, to do it. Okay. Thank okay. you. Two, yeah. two very short questions, uh, finally. The first one is, when you're looking at the work, uh, the AI work which is performed in your data lab, um, concerning the algorithm which exists in the market, there are hundreds uh, of machine learning, etc., and, va and various types of deep learning. Um, generally speaking, do you use existing algorithms or do you build new ones and um, eventually optimize uh, existing ones. What is uh, your production? Is it in producing new algorithm and eventually have patterns on that? Or 
just using and applying what exists? It's a very, very good question. So we do a bit of both. At the end of the day, if there is something out there, so for example, an SE bus, we use any of the libraries, you know, we have our favorite one, but why would I do my own SE bus? I wouldn't. Is we are an apply, I mean we are an apply lab, no our set. However, uh, if we do in something that there is not really a good algorithm out there, and when we did the project in fairness, so for fairness, we created our own algorithms. We actually published papers in archive. I can send the links. Um, we are at the moment uh, filing for three patents in UA, in Europe, in UK and US. Uh, so these algorithms will completely have, because the problem is unfairness. Um, we, we started this project three years ago. There wasn't anything in the in there. At the end of the day, the, the best way to describe we we are we are here to do a speed to value to to add to give Experian a competitive advantage on the on our well, on our competitors. And we do that. You have to be fast. Uh, sometimes, well, if it's something that is really new and we, like for example, no one has the algorithms on fairness we have yet, it will happen at some point, but that give us a competitive advantage. But if it's something that like edgy boost, like everybody have one, uh, we, we just, uh, you know, whatever it is, is quicker. So we'll, we'll utilize that. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, you quote five important elements of successful AI transformation and since you had end-to-end -end, uh, applications running, where do you say it's uh, uh, eventually the most important step? Are all the steps important? Uh, from a technical point of view, for me, uh, use case, and uh, source of value, proof of value, etc., is not a, a huge step, but I would like to know the human factor. The human factor is the most difficult part, for instance, in the organization, in the governance, or in the technical aspect, and what what has what is of prime importance for you to to be successful? Yeah, is it's very good question. So if if I have only you know you, you saw that there is actually quite a few challenges. Um, people struggle, you know, to have the right tools, the right people, and the approach. But for me, if I have to pick one, is the governance. You, you need to have, and for that, you need to have the right the right um, support from the top management you know if, if, if you're doing this in a company and some people have described a middle management like the a permafrost you know like it's not just for ai but for the, all the antibodies of a company so they are middle management is designed to be really risk adverse and they're not going to try anything um so all these things there is a lot of value and, and they work but because a lot of the middle management are are incentivize which is, is a bit that happens also in uh, in public office you know uh, in many places if you do something that is amazing they might give you a big bonus okay but if you if you miss um, uh, something then you could actually um, so if you made a mistake you could get in problem so there is a, a massive imbalance on if you really do something really bad you're gonna be fired if you do something amazing well, you might get a bonus, but it's not there. So, because this imbalance, and that's what normally is with the middle management, you always have to have full support from the from the top, so they can actually really help. And then, you know, technology works, providing you're doing it well. It's just the human element, and how do you overcome this uh, middle management? So, for me, the the one thing you need to look is the governance to make sure there is the right accountability. And the other thing with AI is, don't think of AI as a standard software, the return on investment sometimes actually, unlike normal software, software you put it at the money you put it, start earning money little by little. AI sometimes is exponential. So it takes a while because with AI at the beginning, it might not have good data. So it's still not performing well, some algorithms. Uh, but then once it start getting more and more data, it gets more accurate all of a sudden. Then um, so. The point is the return on investment, and you need to talk to the management. It might be a bit longer, originally, so it's a bit of the trade-off. Look, rather than ending little, little, little very soon, you might take longer, and then, but then when you do it, you do it much, much, much better. Okay, so questions in the uh, by um, 
students. And first of all, uh, there is a question, uh, and that's Mishket we can answer to uh, to share the video for watching it later. Uh, the videos will be uh, re the video is recorded, will be available uh, in uh, the School of Engineering uh, website along with the other webinars and uh, along with the Datum Academy. So that will be uh, shared, of course. And there is a question, what do you see? It's not mine, so it's Harry's question. Uh, what do you see as a future of banking products in terms of AI? What is a revolution we could expect from AI in banking products tomorrow? Beyond fraud, beyond the scoring? But I think you're going to have quite a, uh, you know, if you look at the, the banks usually are divided into front office, middle office and back office. So you customers will see there, there's going to be a lot of um, interaction and it's already happening in process in the back office, which means you will see things done quicker. Uh, in terms of the customer, probably the the best thing you will see and, and is coming uh, is a robot advisor. So effectively, you know, someone who come really is like you talking, you know, the, the problem with their, uh, you know, if you look at the financial advisors uh, at today, unless you have a net worth of few million, it's not, it's not worth it, but they can actually make you money. In the future, these, uh, you know, imagine someone, a robot, which is actually looking constantly at your money and it's giving you advice all the time is, for example, you have a credit card with certain rate, and this this technically can happen today. There are reasons why it's going to take a while, but the machine could be looking all the time new offers on credit cards, and if detects there is a new credit card better and, and it makes the calculation, it might close, you know, you get your old credit card, do that open on your behalf a new credit card with a new vendor, which because it calculated, it knows you're going to get granted, so you don't have to even, that will be automatically, so it will create a new credit card consolidate two or three, close them, and then save you on interest, whatever. He could also, you could do the same for investment, you could do the same for pensions. So a, a personalized, very efficient financial advisor, this will happen. It might take, and as I said, a lot of the technologies are today, but for many reasons, regulatory and everything, they, they is not quite there. So I think for me, the you will have a personalized uh, finance one-to-one, uh, -one and it will feel like you have your own your own uh, personal banker with you all the time. Even, and this is another thing that might happen in the future. Even before you actually, or where you might do some bad financial decisions in terms of, uh, you know, you could take it to the stream. But if you look at optimizing a financial life. You know, most people we don't even think about these things, even in even in, well, in the industry. Uh, but people sometimes make bad decisions in terms of rent versus a mortgage. Uh, should I buy this car? If I buy, should I finance or not? Should I what deposit? I all these things could be done for you, or could be actually be the most efficient. Um, and and at the moment there is a lot of inefficiency. So that, so there is a lot of potential there. Okay, thank you very much. That was a, that's passionating to see what how it will happen in the future to have this kind of online interaction with a robot. A second, another question from Sergio Simonian, a researcher, a deep learning researcher at university, working with us, is the fact that uh, it's very close to the previous one. Um, what applications do you see for large language models in finance as part of? automatization of bank customer interactions. So for me, you answer you answer that question. Uh, maybe you would like to happen something because the question is, uh, do you do you see the emergence of uh, uh, language modeling uh, in finance um, as part of this, of, of this robot automatization, etc.? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the any robot advisor, you're going to have three components. You're going to have the speak to text. So you need to be able, whatever I'm saying, put it on a text file. The second one is analyze the intent, you know, what I'm trying to say. That's what you need NLP. Um, and then finally is what to do about it. That's the other, the, but that's easier. So the, the most difficult one is the, you know, you got your utera, ut, uterans, which is the sentence, you, whatever you said, how do you interpret it and then how do you feedback. So uh, absolutely. I think the other thing, by the way, um, 
NLP is used, I uh, didn't, didn't have time, but another project we did in, with a bank in Italy, which is fascinating, is we can actually listen to a conversation. So, for example, when you default, let's say you cannot pay uh, a credit card and then you default and then, you know, you go into something called collections or people want the money back, so they start calling you. And one of the things they need to do is, is do a repayment plan. And on the repayment plan, it's important to know, are you going to try to do it or not? So we develop a model using NLP, which listening to a lot of these conversations, when the call center called the, the customer and said, look, are you going to pay or not? Well, it was a long, you know, it, it, it has a lot of questions, everything. You know, when we did that, using NLP, we could calculate fairly accurate who was lying and who wasn't. Uh, and the reason is because, and what, you know, the way to do this program is you analyze, you listen to the last year, you know, 100,000 conversations, all these people said they were going to pay, this one didn't, this one did. You get into the machine, you you get the target, which is, look, this. So when you analyze, and this is using big data on NLP, when we analyze all this language, we, we found certain patterns, it's fascinating. So the people that lied, for example, didn't use uh, use third party, sometimes uh, pronoun to, to refer to you, uh, they were very big, so, so there was a lot of signal on the language to estimate this customer is lying, he doesn't want to pay, and why is important? Because if when you're doing, you know, imagine you have a problem, most people, by the way, when they have a problem, they try to pay, uh, repay, and then you you should hold because eventually you get the money back, but if you know someone have no intention to pay, what you do is then you send that to another agency and you sell the debt. And they actually you save a lot of money because otherwise, if if I keep calling you, so the, the way collection works, you know, you own a, a euro. So how many pen and you know people only get a fraction of that? But the sooner I know if you're gonna try to repay or not, the sooner I can uh, reduce my my cost. So this, you know, the, the, there are quite a few. I think I will say a language is quite important because, as I said, on the, on the transactions, on the bank transactions, there is a lot of language and you, there is a lot of signal because whenever you go and buy a coffee, be it or not, on the on the debit, on the payment transaction, there is the locations, there is the, the sort of number, there is. So I think NLP has got a big future for fraud models. You can predict who is. Uh, the other thing we can do is um, we can uh, even uh, using language, uh, do a lot of things. One bank, by the way, they challenge us, which is still, we're still thinking about it, it's, it's a bit too much. I said, look, can you use in voice, if uh, you listen to someone, can you actually uh, give a loan just listening to someone? This is, a, uh, again, NLP. It's a, I give you a, a think mm -hmm. about that. That's a, that's a difficult one. Um, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, that's close to the last question I see uh, in the discussion in the in the chat from Moise. Um, can we teach AI to detect human feelings or to predict it? So that's exactly the, your last comment concern this. Globally speaking, sentiment analysis is part of uh, an AI solution um, somewhere. You just gave a good example with the Bank of Italy. Uh, but beyond that, it is, in this aspect of the detection of human feelings, whether person is cheating, not cheating, uh, comfortable, stress, whatever, uh, is that a function which is of, of importance in any AI solution? That, that is a very, very good question. And here I will say uh, it depends. And so the first one, and this is why concerning, and China is doing things here, which is very, very uh, debatable. So there is so th th there are two things here. Can I looking at the different, for example, looking at your language, looking at your behavior, your transactional behavior, looking at that, can I can I see if you are cheating or y yes in many cases? But th that's one thing. Now, can I, for example, which is the big debate, if I look at you, I do face recognition, can I see if you are upset, happy? That, and I'm very categorically, there is absolutely zero, zero serious research that uh, says, you know, when you have that face, you're happy or no. So the, here there are two problems. Is can you, you know, face recognition is very advanced and can do a lot of things. So that's one 
side of things. So I could see if you are smiling or not. That that is possible. Um, but the other thing, which is which is where um, there are a few, there are a couple of uh, fintech in the US and, and in China that what they're doing is they're looking at your face expression and they are claiming. And, and if you ask me, it's totally that's not true, by the way. And and you should go away. Uh, because the science is not there, you know, and why is not there? Because the uh, all the expressions in the face is very cultural. So, for example, if you are French or Spanish or English or or from any country around the world, every country the expressions are different. We are all different. So there is, as I said, there is no absolutely uh, well, no no zero zero. There are very 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 few, and it's all very. You know, you wouldn't see a lot of PR reviews. You, you wouldn't see proper scientific research that can tell, you know, given expressions on the face, some people say, oh, blah, blah. so therefore there is, especially in the US, I've seen a lot of fintech that said, I can, for example, for interviewing, I, I can do a job interview and I can infer the uh, the feelings or the, the uh, abilities of this person. That is actually very wrong, but it's, which is the irony the the AI could can actually understand the the face recognition and everything, but scientifically the you know there is no a correlation, a universal correlation between uh, our expression in in the face and our feelings, that has been shown so many times. So just with the face recognitions emotions, you know maybe and a bit uncategorically, it's not possible. The science is not there. You know, you might think I'm unhappy or unhappy now. You know, there are some cultures that they they are less prone to smile. That doesn't mean they're unhappy. They they just don't smile. At the same time, there might be cultures. You know, in the Nordics, sometimes people they're a bit. Uh, you know, you think they are all the time really happy, smiling, and actually half of them are depressed because they don't have sun. So you you can't really, as I said, the science is not there. At the same time. When you get a lot of different data points from different places, it is possible to get a lot of the human, predict a lot of the human behavior, like, you know, what you're going to do next, whether you're cheating or not. Those things are possible, but it's different from, you know, the fair recognition and the and the, feeling, and the, the feelings. Okay. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm through with the questions I see from uh, uh, the students, from myself. Um, Mishket, since uh, you follow the complete stuff, if you have yes. any extra question, uh, please, uh, I give you back the the word for the and to let everybody knows what happens uh, with the presentation, when it will be online, etc. So, Mishket, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. So, so thank you, everyone. Thank you all for participating in this very, very interesting webinar. Thank you, Javier, for having been kind enough to share with us all your knowledge on artificial intelligence and more specifically in the field of finance. So uh, you will all receive by email the link to the replay of the video tomorrow morning, as well as the presentation in PDF format. And if nobody has uh, no more questions, I wish you a good end of afternoon and a good weekend to all. Goodbye, everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Javier, for your webinar. And I'm quite sure we'll have a fruitful cooperation in the future. We'll, we'll do. I just post a link, by the way, uh, which talking about the feelings, don't buy shares in this company. You will lose money. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, okay. Have a thank nice you. weekend and, and good luck and uh, take care. You Thanks, Javier.